first advanced international summer, sorry, seminar on cognition, culture, and in evolutionary context. Um, well, you know that my name is Fernando Colmenares and Maria Victoria Nade Lloreda. We are responsible for <coughs> inviting the uh, speakers and um, we have also, we will share the sessions that we will have over this one day and a half uh, meeting. Um, so the first thing I want, I want to say is that we wholeheartedly thank the speakers for coming, for accepting to be involved in this project and for making room in their very busy agendas and to come to Madrid and to share altruistically rather than m mutualistically their knowledge with us. So as you can see the screen is black. Uh, it should be uh, some much nicer image over there. Um, <coughs> so I would like to stress that the five speakers are among the top, top ten leaders in the field. And science, I would say, is what scientists do. And science progresses when scientists work hard and make the results of their work visible by publishing it in the best scientific journals and when they spend time training and teaching uh, pre-doctoral and doctoral students. And, um, okay, I'm here. Um, so I, I, I would like to say that this is a very good exa example of um, cultural inheritance, the experience that we are going to have here. Um, I would also say that um, science is the outcome of creative minds working collectively and it is disseminated through all the three modes of inheritance, so horizontally, obliquely, and vertically. Importantly, an indicator of how much a scientist has potentially contributed to push forward a field of science is the number of intellectual offspring or descendants they, they produce and the number of citations of their work. And the panel of distinguished speakers that will deliver the forthcoming lectures excel in all of these respects. Uh, they have been highly prolific in, in teaching, training, pre-doctoral and postdoctoral students who are now um, qualified researchers and established lecturers in very important universities in the US and in, in Europe. And they have very high scores of high impacted papers um, <coughs> Of the, and, sorry, and they have very high, as I said, they have uh, a lot of books, as we will mention when we introduce each of them individually. And the impact of their publications in the field is outstanding, as indicated by the number of citations they have accumulated. They regularly published in the top impact scientific journals, Science, Nature, PNAS, Proceedings, and so on and their books, their books have been published by the best academic presses, Harvard University Press, Cambridge University Press, Oxford University Press, Princeton University Press, and so on. Um, <coughs> they have been, many of these books have been translated into many other languages other than, than English. And some of these books also have received uh, awards. So they have all made massive and key contributions to uh, the field. And actually, many would say that they have uh, shaped the field the way it looks today. Okay. Now, I'm sorry we don't have any, yeah, no, okay. So, <coughs> although the study of culture itself is not our group field of expertise, 
We are running some ongoing research pro projects on cooperation in primates and non-human primates, and also in, on imitation in marine mammals. On the other hand, culture, cognition, and eco evo devo um, are all topics that I and some of my colleagues cover when we teach um, our undergrads foundations of psychobiology. Before we, we listen to the lectures that our invited speakers will deliver, we thought that it would be helpful to start off by spending a few minutes introducing the seminar's topic. The goal of the short introduction um, <coughs> that follows is to provide some background information on the issues that will be covered in the uh, speaker's lectures. Of course, we hope you enjoy this seminar and find it a learning experience worth spending your time on. Okay, now things are getting complicated uh, because I now um, would need to have So what's the problem, what's the, the, the major topic that we set out to address in this seminar? And the, um, the picture that will come out soon <laughs> will, will show, I think it captures very well, very nicely, the problem. We are gonna, we're going to see um, we're going to see two young primates, a um, chimpanzee and a human. Uh, they, they are using tools. So the chimpanzee, well actually this is the picture that uh, is in the, in, the, uh, in the poster announcing the seminar. So uh, you might remember it. Um, so the chimpanzee is using a stick. I mean, this is a bit of fantasy, but uh, it's using a, a stick to uh, clean his nose. And the, obviously he's unaware that he's being watched. And the human baby is um, using a tool as well. He's using a iPad to watch her cousin primate um, using a tool. Obviously she's unaware that it has taken many generations to produce that, uh, that tool. Um, so the point is, I mean that's the empirical problem. And what we are, um, what we will do is to inquire and to explore what are the developmental and evolutionary processes that underlie um, cultural behavior. I mean, in this particular case of tool using, they are supposed to represent a kind of a, a type of um, material. Uh, sorry. You, um, they are using a behavior which is um, supposed to be functional and that um, uh, represents one of the categories of, of uh, culture, which is uh, uh, material, m material culture. And so we want to see to what extent different species use um, comparable behaviors to solve a particular task, and to what extent those behaviors, those, um, in this case, things that can be observable from outside are actually uh, based on the same cognitive mechanisms. 
And so this is one of the major challenges in this area, which is to what extent uh, comparable behaviors are actually based on processes that might be analogs or homologs. Um, so culture, uh, in brief, I would say that culture is about uh, behavior, about uh, symbols, about um, norms, about um, Right, okay. mm -hmm. So, um, one way of defining culture is uh, to say that uh, culture is about the way we do things, the way we play music, the way we write literature, the way we dance, and 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 so on, and and the way of of course we the way we behave in different contexts. It is about ethics, morality, norms, and. Of course, it also includes language, uh, science, religion, politics, technology, and, and very importantly, social institutions. Um, so, we know that culture is sustained by cognitive mechanisms and by uh, brain structures. And something that we want to study is what is the nature of the relationship between um, observable behaviors, observable brain mechanisms, and an observable cognitive mechanisms that have to be inferred from uh, behavior. And so this interaction between, between those three levels of analysis are um, are important and sorry <laughs> um, so here I give there I give um, two working definitions of, of culture. I must say that th there are many in the field that there is not a um, consensus about which one is the best. And then I anticipate that uh, the speakers will have their own, probably they will have their own definitions. And as always, definitions tend to be tailored to their research or their field interests. Um, so the first definition gotcha. I'm sorry Well, 
Por suerte todos sabemos que la cultura tiene mucho más que ver con el pensamiento y la discusión que va a ocurrir a lo largo de este día y medio que con las herramientas eh, tan técnicas eh, a las que hemos llegado después de siglos de evolución y espero que a partir de ahora tengamos eh, un poco más de suerte con la técnica. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned already what's a, a major definition of, of culture, and then I mentioned that uh, we, are in, we are interested in understanding this relationship between those three um, levels of analysis. So how is culture interacting with um, the cognitive systems that sustain cultural behavior and how those cognitive systems actually uh, depend on brain functions and brain organization and then how the two of them um, contribute to the kind of observable behaviors, cultural behaviors that we, we see. Now, I mentioned that I was going to give a couple of definitions, this uh, a broad definition in which um, we emphasize the fact that, that information is learned or is inherited from others, um, that um, those behaviors tend to be group specific, group typical, uh, so there are intergroup differences in, in the behaviors, and then they tend to be stable across generations. And then we have the narrow, narrow definition in which researchers get a bit demanding and then they restrict cultural uh, behavior um, if it is based on two high, highly demanding uh, forms of cognition which is imitation and teaching and, and also they also th they uh, claim that uh, the ratcheting effect so the idea that um, uh, culture uh, is accumulated across generations and they produce this, um, um, this large amount of cultural behavior from one generation which is very different and so this would be a caricature of what I'm saying obviously I'm, I'm, I'm pushing a bit uh, the, the, the distinction but as you can see here in each generation the amount of information that is accumulated and they have to be uh, process and have to be passed on to the uh, other individuals is very is a very is a is a core feature of of culture in this definition in the narrow definition. Whereas in the other, what we see is that there are not very many differences across generations in the amount of information that is required to be to be learned. Uh, okay, so. This narrow definition emphasizes the fact that social learning can occur through many different vias. And what we see here is that there are three, I mean, there are many classifications. The taxonomies of uh, types of, so of social learning are really very abundant. And here we have one. So in the cognitively demanding version, uh, I mean, categories of social learning, we have emulation, we have imitation, and have teaching. Um, so, with regards to imitation, this could be um, a way of approaching the problem of imitation. So, imagine that we are seeing someone uh, using, a t uh, using a particular behavior, actually, pl uh, behavior plus a tool, which might be a key, and it's inserting the key inside a lock. Then, this is the, um, these are the behaviors that can be observed. And what we see is that it's a, as a result, sorry, um, doing that produces a result. And the result is that the, the, the door is unlocked. So both are observable, and there is this, this causal relationship between uh, what we see in terms of behavior, and in this particular case, tool use, and the effect it has. And then 
depending on the response of the individual when he's doing this particular behavior, we can infer what was the goal of the uh, individual. So if there is a match between the uh, inferred goal on the part of the individual and the result, then we actually will be testing and that actually that behavior was goal directed and it was obtained the, uh, result, the desired results. So if we bring this into the context of the study of imitation, the individual becomes a demonstrator. He may not know that he's been observed. And then we have the observer. This is a scheme, this is an approach that was um, um, proposed by Josep Kahl and Malinda Carpenter. And so they wanted to see what were the sources of inf information that could be pro processed and taken into account in order to produce the different categories of um, social learning, um, sorry, of categories of, of imitation. And then what we, what we see is that the observer can see the behavior, can see the results, and may be sensitive to may be able to understand and to perceive what are the, goal, the intended goals of the individual. And again, I want to emphasize that uh, individuals can, there are, they, there are certain elements in this chain that can be directly observed, and then there's something that has to be inferred from those observations. And it seems that at least by, I mean, this is something that is changing uh, very rapidly in the field, but in 2011, um, some experts in this area would say that both chimpanzees and, and humans are able to, um, to process those three sources of information, but apparently there's a, s a slight difference between chimpanzees and, and humans in that humans pay more attention to the actual behaviors that are done than chimpanzees and also that humans seem to do that more spontaneously and more naturally and more skillfully than uh, chimpanzees. So the second, um, I would say, high, um, highly complex forms of, of um, social learning is teaching. So here we have a definition uh, that could um, illustrate this, this um, process in which what we see is that on the one, one hand there is the instructor which scaffolds the pupil to, um, by providing information that uh, she doesn't know and, and to actively correct mistakes that uh, she could make on the one hand and uh, on the other this is also very important. Pupils learn behavior, but they also learn uh, things that are not tangible. They learn concepts, and they learn how to use them to actually create knowledge, if they like. Um, and in order to do that, it is very important, once more again, the underlying mechanism, which is uh, sustaining, sustaining this complex forum of teaching or this definition of teaching is that um, they require complex cognitive mechanisms to do that. Whereas in the functional teaching, that, uh, sorry, in, in, the, in the functional definition of teaching, what we see is that we can circumvent all these problems by just looking at what the individuals do, what are the contexts in which they do. For example, do um, demonstrators direct, modify their behavior in the only in the presence of um, observers. So like they may take into account whether the observers are already experienced or unexperienced. And also in this functional definition, it is very important to, um, to mention that the instructor incurs some cost uh, or no immediate benefit whereas the um, people gets information that otherwise would take maybe uh, 
weeks, months, or years to pick. Now, obviously, the topic of the relationship between culture and intelligence is uh, very important and has been addressed by uh, many researchers in this area. And um, basically, the, the idea here is that every trait and every uh, ability, every cognitive skill is um, thought to be selected for in a given environment. So there are certain environments, certain niches that select for greater intelligence. Whether we consider that intelligence a domain a general um, capacity or a domain specific, what we see is that there should be a relationship between the demands that the individuals encounter in their niches and the uh, traits that they evolve in order to meet those demands, in order to adapt to those demands. And in this particular area, so there are, I mean, there's this idea that maybe um, the complexity of the social environment, the social niche, has promoted the evolution, the greater intelligence, and whether um, what um, happens is that those niches have um, selected for very specific, let's say, modular, modular kinds of intelligences. You see here, we see social intelligence, cultural intelligence, which means that those skills that are particularly helpful to maximize your fitness in those area, in those uh, niches, will be promoted, will be fostered by natural selection. And something that also has been brought into this area is it and trying to understand the relationship between brain size and brain organization and the kinds of uh, skills that are uh, required to deal with different kinds of social or ecological uh, problems and demands. So I think that we will see here, because some of the experts in this area are uh, uh, going to speak uh, in this seminar, we will see that there are really very interesting correlations between um, social learning, uh, a social or individual learning, and, and different variables related to brain size and so on. So cooperation is a very important component of, of culture, not only in, in, in humans, but also in many other group living species. And this is a picture, this is a scheme, this is Hamilton's scheme, very famous one, uh, where we see the payoff matrix, so the effects of an individual's behavior on the actors, on the actors, sorry, and the uh, recipient of that behavior. And what we see here is that the, we, could, we could actually measure the impact on the individual's uh, welfare or on the individual's uh, fitness. And what we see here is that this impact can be positive, so could be fitness increasing or negative, fitness decreasing or welfare, whatever. And then what we see is this uh, arrangement, arrangement in which on this side we see those behaviors that benefit the recipient and they can be mutu mutualistic or altruistic here if the benefit that the recipient gets uh, is at a cost to the uh, actor. And on this side, what we see is uh, two categories of behaviors that initially are anything but cooperative. Um, they are competitive and this, this particular one, this category is particularly interesting, I would say. It is called a spite in which both the recipient and the actor uh, incur a cost. And this has come by different names, like punishment, in which the, um, the behavior actually can be exploitative, can be uh, a way to coerce some, uh, someone in the, in, in, the, in the group to be cooperative or to benefit the actor. Um, so that still sounds uh, rather competitive, not cooperative. But then we can 
break down this uh, category into two subcategories. One would be it's still a spike, but actually we could refer to this category uh, as uh, revenge or retaliation when you are actually being uh, nasty to someone who has been uncooperative to you. So you can sort of try to, um, to make someone um, modify their behavior so that you can get a benefit. And then we have this other category which turn green because now it is cooperative. So what we're seeing here is this third party punishment in which individuals act actually punish others that are uh, non-cooperative uh, non and this is a very important mechanism to um, enforce social norms and to um, prevent non-cooperators uh, to behave uh, in that way. So revenge and altruistic punishment. Right, and this another issue which is receiving attention recently, which is how, what is the, to what extent individuals, when they are engaged in social interactions, to what extent they take into account, on the one hand, what are the effects of their own behavior on others, if they care or not. Um, this is something which has to do with whether the behavior is um, self-regarding or other-regarding. And, and also, it is important, as you can see here, to understand whether they are really concerned and to what extent they can sort of connect with the feelings that others have, and they can have those feelings can be aligned, which means that, for example, in this particular uh, situation, they um, are happy when others are happy, or uh, another form of alignment of emotion is when you are sad, when others are sad, so that's empathy. And, but then we have these other two categories in which the feelings of the individual and uh, the uh, recipient are uh, misaligned. So we have this situation in which you envy, you have envy or you are jealous at someone else's uh, fortunes, or you are happy when somebody else is sad. And this is tremendously important. I mean, these kind of emotions that uh, probably are underlying social action and cooperation are very important because uh, as we will dis probably discuss to, uh, tomorrow in the um, discussion session, uh, we will see that some of these emotions are actually very adaptive and very useful to um, understand what's going on within groups and how they contribute to enforce norms and so on. This is a particular example, by the way, of punishment, which is antisocial punishment. This antisocial punishment is uh, based, might be based on emotions that we might say that are negative, and, um, but they, contribute, they certainly contribute a lot to the way individuals organize within groups and the way norms are or not effective. So I'm gonna end by mentioning three, making three highlights. The first is that culture is both the product, is, 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 is both a, a product and producer of, I would say, co-evolves with sociality, competition, cooperation, brain size and organization, and especially socio-cognitive skill. So what I want to say is that every thing, every adaptation that evolves in any of these areas has an influence, an influence on the others, and all of them um, co-evolve, as we will see in many of the, uh, some of the talks that uh, will follow. And this picture of co-evolving uh, different um, mechanisms at the level of sociality or cooperation and so on are very important. The, um, I think they help us organize the information that we have to study and to understand that um, the relationship between all these uh, 
um, ingredients of um, culture and of social organizations are uh, very uh, are key to understand any of the traits characteristics that define each of them. So we couldn't understand what's what is driving the evolution of sociality or the evolution of brain, or the evolution of culture, if we don't have this picture of interrelationships between all of them. The second is that, is that culture is adaptive, but actually culture can be maladaptive as well. So what I'm saying is that culture has an impact on the individual's short-term welfare, but also on their fitness. So obviously it depends on the context in which those different, uh, the variation in, in cultural variation can have different uh, effects on individuals within groups. And the third highlight has to do with the role of history. I think that developmental psychologists and, and developmental biologists are very, very much aware of uh, the importance of, of um, history. So on the one hand, we have that <coughs> culture <coughs> develops over the, of, over the individual's lifetime. So it's not something that is sprung into being from the beginning. So it has to, you have to interact with your environment. You have to interact with the um, um, culture you are exposed to in order to develop yourself, your uh, cultural behavior. Um, on the other hand, culture is inherited from your ancestor, I mean your uh, close ancestors within your own lineage. And so we, we learn from, us, from members of previous generations. And, and also very important is that there's a, a legacy, which means that there are many of the traits, many of the brain structures, many of the way the brain organizes information, many of the ways that um, the cognitive skills develop and are used in a functional way, they are related to our distant, remote history as members of lineages. And a point that I'm going to make just to finish is that uh, something that we will discuss tomorrow very, very probably, uh, maybe also today, is that the traits that we inherit from our uh, remote ancestors can be modified over the course of uh, our evolutionary history, which means that evolution um, makes individuals, sorry, species to share traits, but also make species unique. And then we have to understand that, that both mechanisms, continuity and discontinuity, should be expected and actually occurs. Right. Um, so I, I, I hope this short introduction will have uh, given you some uh, concepts, some introduction of the uh, concepts that we are going to hear in this uh, series of lectures. But um, now I'm just going to introduce the first speaker, um, Professor Mike Tomasello. And I want to say that he, he studied in psychology, sorry, so he studied psychology in Duke University and experimental psychology in, uh, sorry, in Georgia University. And he had, he held positions from 80 to, from 1980 to 1998 uh, as assistant, associate, and full professor in, in, Emory, in Emory University. And since 1998, he's co-director of the Maxman Institute for Revolutionary Anthropology. He's also co-director of the Wolfhorn Keller Primate Research Center. And he's, he's one of the, well, I believe that he's the managing director of the Maxman Institute. Um, his research focuses on uh, processes of social cognition, social learning, and communication and language in human children and, and great apes. He has produced a lot of books. Uh, some of them have, it, have been translated into 13 languages. And <coughs> I'm not gonna uh, mention because you, have, you can actually check this information in the internet. He has received many, many uh, awards 
and international prizes for the books and, and obviously for his contributions to this field. I can mention the William James Book Award by the American Psychological Association, the Fishing Foundation Prize for Cognitive Science, um, the Sid Frederick Bartlett Prize and Lectureship in the United, in the United Kingdom, the Heineken Prize for Cognitive Science, Royal Academy of Netherlands, and the last one I have here is the Helmuth Plessner Prize um, by the Helmuth Plessner Society. Um, so thank you very much uh, for coming, uh, Mike.